there's a bunch of different ways that you can use x-rays in medicine. In fact, you can actually use them to treat cancer. But in this video, we're just going to be looking at how they're used to scan the inside of somebody's body. There's a couple of different ways you can do that. First thing we need to do is actually make x-rays. Where do we get them from? Well, you might guess that these photons need to come from electrons. That's supposed to be a filament, by the way, not a spork. When you heat a filament up, you get what you call thermionic emission. Electrons have enough energy to escape the surface, kind of like the photoelectric effect, but they're not absorbing any photons. They then get accelerated by a cathode. That means it's negatively charged, so that's going to repel the electrons. And then we have the anode, which they're going to be accelerated towards. That's made of tungsten. Because it's an anode, that means it's positively charged. These electrons fly towards the anode, they smack into it. The electrons in the anode are excited and then they de excite, therefore emitting x rays out. The more energy that the electrons smack the tungsten anode with, the greater the frequency of the x rays produced. Let's say that this is about 50 kilovolts, therefore, the energy of the photons being released will be around, we're always going to be less than 50 killer electron volts because you know to get from a pd to an energy we just times by charge e equals qv but we don't just get one flavor of photon being produced no what we have is a continuous distribution of x-ray photon energies this continuous spectrum is given a german word bremsstrahlung now why do we have these spikes here though well they're given different letters we say l and k L and K are characteristic radiation from the tungsten. And this is due to electrons dropping an energy level to fill the gaps left by ejected electrons. The electrons coming in don't necessarily have to collide with the electron on the outer shell, as it were, of the tungsten atoms. An electron could collide with an electron that's right next to the nucleus. That one escapes, but the problem is, is that it's left a gap. So an electron drops down from the level above, and that's when we get these L and K photons being produced. The problem is, is that it's not very efficient. Only about 1% of the energy of the electrons is actually converted into X-rays. The other 99% is converted into heat. So what we do is we rotate it to keep it cool. That's because if the electrons hit just the same spot on the tungsten all the time, you're in for a bad time. If you increase the current going into the cathode, that means you're going to get more electrons striking the tungsten anode every second. So that means you're going to get more x-rays. The x-rays will not be changed. They'll be the same frequency, but you'll have more of them. If you have more x-rays, though, that means that the beam of x-rays will be more intense. If you keep the current the same, but you change the PD across the cathode and the anode, well, that means, like we said, that the electrons are going to have more energy. That means that the x-rays will have more energy. Again, you've just made the beam more intense. Just like when you're taking a picture or taking a video like I am now, you want a nice sharp image, not something like this. So for a sharp image with a normal x-ray, put detector plate, that is the film, close to the person. Usually they're lying on it. Have the x-ray tube far away. Okay, we're not talking about a mile, but we're not talking about a couple of inches either. That way, we can be more sure that the rays are going in parallel, not spreading out, not diverging as they go through the person and hit the film. I should probably just say safer. If you use a lead grid in front of the film, that stops any scattered x-rays. And so that's making sure that it's only the x-rays coming directly down, not ones that are coming in at an angle that aren't from the tube directly hitting the film. All right, let's get an equation all up in this then. Whenever x-rays pass through anything, or when any radiation passes through anything, it's attenuated. That means that intensity is reduced the further the radiation goes through something. And so the intensity at a certain point is equal to the initial intensity times E to the minus mu x. So this is the intensity at, let's put depth, this is the initial intensity. This is the thickness. And here we have some constant. This is the coefficient of attenuation or the attenuation coefficient. And that is the thing that changes from material to material. 
They might be thinking that this looks somewhat similar to the radioactivity equation. And yeah, you'd be absolutely right. It is basically the same, but instead of a decay constant and time, we have a coefficient of attenuation and thickness. We know that whatever's here can't have a unit. And so therefore, if this is in meters, then we know that mu must be in meters to the minus one. And so it follows similar rules. If we want to know the half thickness, that is the distance at which the intensity has halved, that is equal to log two divided by, but instead of the decay constant, it's just, I want to it, it's just mu, the attenuation coefficient. There's also one more equation though, and that is this. It's mu, but not quite mu. Mu m is called the mass attenuation coefficient. This basically tells you how much attenuation you have. Just like with the radioactivity equation, if you want to find a thickness from this, then you have to log both sides and etc. etc. You have a ratio. If you don't know how to do that, then have a look at my radioactivity equation video. And the reason that an x-ray works is because different density materials attenuate x-rays different amounts. In other words, they have a different mu. So bone and soft tissue have a different coefficient of attenuation. And so that means that bone and soft tissue will be contrasted in the image. If bone and soft tissue had the same coefficient of attenuation, then the whole film would be black. There would be no white areas, no black areas. We wouldn't be able to see the difference. So that's the important thing. We need to be able to see this contrast in the final image. But what if we're looking at a bit of the body which does have bits that are of a similar attenuation coefficient? Well, we can use a barrier meal to produce contrast. If that goes into your gut, let's say, then you will be able to see the stomach clearly contrasted with what's around the stomach because of the barium in it. And that's because it has a high proton number, high atomic number. As a rule of thumb, the higher the proton number, the atomic number, the higher the coefficient of attenuation. So that's the bog standard way that you can use x-rays, just a normal x-ray photograph as it were, but we can use x-rays to get a more in-depth look at what's going on. And that is with a CT scan, that stands for computed tomography. And similarly to loads of the scanners that we've seen already like MRI and PET scanners, we have a ring and the person, let's say, we're taking a scan of their chest. We have a source of x-rays. We have the x-ray tube there. That fires x-rays out. And they go through the person. And then we have detectors. And then what you do is rotate the source around. So we have 2D slices. And that can build a very high quality, high resolution image. Problem with that though? Well, it involves a heck of a lot of x-rays going through your body. Instead of just one flash, as it were, of x-rays for a couple of seconds, this has to be going for a long time. And so you really aren't allowed many of these a year. Whereas having a few normal x-rays in a year is usually perfectly fine. CT scans are quite quick and dirty, as it were. They're cheaper than PET scans or MRIs. So that's the basics of X-ray scans. Hope you found that helpful. If you did, then please leave a like. And if you have any questions or comments, put them down below. And I'll see you next time.